Our exploration of the world's super allocators would be incomplete without touching down in France, a lesser known and different but significant sovereign wealth fund. We've interviewed Nikolai Tangen at the Norwegian Sovereign Wealth Fund, but European countries have generally not developed these segregated pools of capital with longer term investment goals, unlike many other nations. And who better to discuss France's approach than with a knight of the Légion d'honneur, the highest French order of merit established in 1802 by Napoleon Bonaparte. Therefore, Nicolas Tufoc, general manager of the Banque Publique d'Investissement, BPI, since its creation in 2013, welcome to the Money Miss podcast. Good morning. Well, I noted as I studied your journey that we were born 20 days apart. However, you are, you are just my senior. So uh, it's a great pleasure having seen and studied your career to, to have you here today. So, so welcome. Now, I read that by the time you were a student at HEC, the French business school, you'd already created five startups. Is that true? No, it's absolutely true. At that time, we were not speaking of startups. We were speaking of uh, SMEs. So uh, some of them were were uh, industry based in 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 the food industry in the in the plastics industry and so forth. So you have this sort of entrepreneurial flair one senses and you studied at the uh, ENA and for those who don't know of our audience around the world l'école nationale d'administration is is no longer but was and for such a long time regarded as the absolute pinnacle of excellence for preparing young folks for both professional work in the public and private sectors. And how did you weigh up the public sector versus the private sector? So um, I did business school and then I, I did ENA. And at the same time, I created startups. Um, to be honest, uh, I created five, five uh, small companies at that time. Four were a failure. <laughs> <laughs> and and, and I, I was heavily indebted. And the fifth one allowed me to reimburse the debts. And um, I always thought, I, I remember that uh, or you are an entrepreneur or you serve your country. But, uh, but, but in the middle, being just a high ranking official of a private company, it was not something I, was, I, I thought was desirable at the time. Uh, and so I, 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 was, I was very pro pragmatic. I was, I was at the same time preparing myself to be a servant of the country and an entrepreneur. And it happened that uh, I became a servant of the country. It didn't last very long. It lasted maximum two years. And then after I discovered the internet and I went uh, to uh, France Telecom to create uh, the internet uh, access uh, subsidiary, which was called WannaDo. And I said there 10 years. So we're going to come back to technology later on because it's so important in this whole discussion on innovation and productivity. But just pausing because many of us of a certain age absolutely remember want to do and we remember France Telecom and we remember Europe's advantageous position in TMT relative to many other parts of the world. Um, and I wondered what it was that really helped you at both want to do and France Telecom in preparing you for your later stages? Well, for, first of all, uh, I, was, I was lucky enough to have a, a boss who was the CEO of France Telecom at that time, who was Michel Bon, who literally gave me the keys of uh, the, the uh, internet adventure of the group. I had discovered internet in uh, New Orleans at the NCTA forum. It was in the spring of 1993. And I came back to France and I called France Telecom and I said, this is exactly what I want to do. Uh, and uh, it was pure entrepreneurship. And I, I would never have been in a position to create that company, which became uh, big. Uh, we listed it for 20 billion euros in, the, in July 2000. It was the last major IPO of the internet scene in Europe. If I hadn't uh, built my own companies before. So that was, that was the, the, the continuity of experience. And then after, then after what I do, I left uh, the telecom, the telecom sector, and I joined the IT sector. I was the deputy CEO of Capgemini, and Capgemini, we, we brought it from uh, fifty thousand people to one hundred and fifty thousand people, and most of the difference uh, became uh, linked to our, our our settlements in India. And so, so I, I had I had ten years of uh, extraordinary extraordinary adventure. 
uh, for globalization in India. There's a circularity here. When I looked at some of Cap Gemini's materials today, they have this catchphrase, which is unlocking the value of technology, which is not new. And we'll come back to that, as I said, when we talk about productivity. But then you are approached, obviously, sometime around 2012, 2013, to head up this new venture. And um, let's just start at the beginning, because we said this is an unusual sovereign wealth fund. Just let, explain to us, please, its genesis. The genesis of, uh, of BPI France is basically the disindustrialization of the country uh, after the year 2000. France, as far as industry is concerned, missed the opportunities of globalization. Uh, there was a, a policy mix, a social mix, which was not adapted to uh, the first competition that started at that moment. And therefore, we lost half of our factories. And we destroyed probably 1.7 million jobs in industry, exactly like in the US and in the and UK. Only those three countries disindustrialized massively. And, uh, the rest of Europe, Northern Europe notably, protected itself. Italy was also reasonably competitive, but it was not the case for France. Therefore, at the end of, uh, of that decade, uh, there was the political project to create a, a sort of mega bank to rejuvenate the French economy and notably the industry. And it was called BPI. There was one advisor of the French president at that time who was called Emmanuel Macron. And Emmanuel Macron called me. It was uh, the, uh, it, it, at the beginning of the month of October 2012. I didn't know anything about that project. I didn't even know the acronym of BPI. I was fully, fully dedicated to Capgemini. But um, I looked at it, and I, I remember my, my sort of uh, passion for entrepreneurship and my deep respect for French entrepreneurs. And I thought there was something to there was something to do. There was something very interesting to do. So that was the gen genesis. Just take us through the evolution. Right. So uh, of course, it was extremely. Politically uh, influenced at that time, there were there were lots of quarrels about about what it should be. You know, in France, we 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 have thirteen regions like the German lenders, and they they wanted to capture the organization, uh, the different. So, I mean, in a nutshell, it, it was it was quite violent. So, uh, I I, deci I decided to impose a view which uh, is basically the bank of today, huh? which is a very homogeneous organization, fully dedicated to entrepreneurs in France, from, from the small one, SME, to uh, the, the mega French uh, multinationals, which are listed uh, in Euronext or, uh, or in Amsterdam. And this is basically what we do. So, so uh, our business lines are, first of all, loans. So we, we, we are... Uh, selling or granting every year 15 billion euros of loans. And this is the reason why we are regulated by the European Central Bank. So we are one of the major French banks. Then we have an equity business. We, we are managing 55 billion euros and we're investing in equity 5 billion per year directly uh, through all, all the verticals and theses possible and indirectly through a major funds of funds activity Funds of funds wise, we're investing 1.5 billion per year minimum. And then we have a, a third business line, which is innovation financing. We are pouring uh, in the French economy in 2023, 7 billion euros of innovation financing only in the year. Huh? So that's really massive. Now we have a fourth business line, which is guarantee. We guarantee the French banks for the most, most risky loans. Uh, we allow them to do uh, every year up to 15 billion euros of risky loans guaranteed by us. And then we have a fifth business unit, which is export credit and export guarantee, Exim Bank. We're the Exim Bank of France. And um, on top of that, we, we have become, probably is it because I, I spent 10 years at Capgemini, probably the biggest French structure for uh, consulting dedicated to SMEs. There was nothing in that respect before, you know, so it's executive education for, for SME leaders and, and consulting for them. 
Uh, of course, they cannot they cannot afford to pay Accenture uh, or, or McKinsey or Capgemini and so forth. They they can't. So uh, there was really a market failure, and we and we uh, created a, a toolbox which is which is quite efficient. And it's, uh, the consequence of it being that we are doing every year seven thousand consulting assignments for the French SMEs. Yeah. So all this is in a square structure. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's not a holding. You have 50 branches on the field, and each branch in, in the smallest cities of France is uh, embodying that toolbox, the full toolbox. So the, the French entrepreneur goes to the branch and opens a business dialogue, and then we sort of knit up and orchestrate a solution in which there will be a little bit of uh, loan, a little bit of equity, a bit of consulting, and so forth. That's, that's the way we, we operate. That's very clear. Thank you. And we'll dive into a few of those. But in reading some of your materials, the comment that struck me perhaps above all else was your mission to galvanize the French economy. And I wondered if you could just unpick that a little bit. How do you define the mission of galvanizing an economy which, like many other European economies, has had disappointing growth and productivity. From the start, I acknowledged the fact that um, we should be a sort of psycho bank. I explained myself. I always thought that, that banking has a sort of Freudian dimension. You, you, you have to, to trigger the desire of the entrepreneur to do more, uh, to, uh, you know, Get the projects out of the uh, uh, out of the out of, of the board, and and you've got to do it. Uh, and the sort of uh, you can do it uh, mentality is something that I wanted to push in France, and it be it happens to have been quite efficient. I mean, because uh, we were a solitary voice at the beginning. You can imagine it was in the winter 2012, 2013. France was in deep crisis. It was really dark, uh, with a lot of sort collective melancholia. So when you have a, a bank which is yellow, like it's, it's the case of BPI France, who says everything is possible. We are a California. We don't know it, but we are, and we are a star a startup nation. We can make it, and so forth. All all the basically all the American values, I would say, huh? It made a tremendous difference. Tremendous difference, and and it really galvanized a new generation of entrepreneurs. It told them that they could become mainstream. It was a dream at the time, but now it's a reality. Uh -huh. You have you have statistics which are flabbergasting in France. You, you have you have today fifty percent of the youngsters who say they want to be entrepreneurs. You know, remember uh, at the beginning of the tw of the years two thousand, you had sixty percent of the French young people who wanted to be civil servants. So it, it's been, it's a complete uh, anthropological change, and that is that does surprise me because we don't associate it with, and we'll talk about you know innovation in a second. We don't associate it with a lot of Europe. What's been behind that shift in youthful um, ambition? It was built on uh, the rising wave of a new generation, social generation of of young entrepreneurs. Some of them not so young which have lived through the first wave of internet. Some of them uh, had made a first fortune with Minitel. It's the case of Xavier Niel, for example. And, um, and, and you had, uh, you had the, uh, a burgeoning ecosystem of venture capital funds, which had been patiently built after, I would say, 1998. Uh, uh, so patiently, you know, under the radars during 10 years, there was the building of that ecosystem, and suddenly produced all the green shots of uh, the year 12, uh, 2012. And there was a political trigger, which was uh, the tax reform of François Hollande, who was uh, considered as punitive by this new generation. And this new generation launched a, a riot, I would say, uh, which was called the pigeons. They said, uh, we are not the pigeons of France. You, you are not going to tax us uh, as you think. And uh, there was, a, there was a, a media uproar about that, uh, that, that, that uh, sort of insurrection of entrepreneurs. They became famous. 
and they revealed their power in the French society. It was autumn 2012. And from that, the political conditions of the creation of what we call now the French tech were met. It's always the same. Huh? You need economy and you need also political conditions. All that happened at the moment BPI France was created, December 2012. One of the most difficult things, unlike managing a pool of capital, is defining and measuring success. How do you think about how your job is going? So, um, I mean, good for the French taxpayers. We are very profitable. <laughs> we have posted a 2 billion euros net result in 2021. 1.6 billion in 2022, um, and all this comes 90% from uh, our equity business. Our equity business is is uh, is very successful. So first off, we, uh, as I told you, we invest 1.6 billion per year in funds of funds. So the performance is the performance of the underlying portfolio of the 500 funds that we finance. Some of them outside of France, by the way. And, and uh, most of the French funds in which we invest are themselves investing outside of France up to 50%. So we have a, a, an underlying portfolio of companies, which is basically 6,000 companies, uh, which is of very good quality, generating very good distributions, which are fueling the result of PPI. Huh? So some funds do uh, 1.7x, some funds do 3x, uh, all this is, uh, is absolutely market practice. And as far as our direct investments are concerned, I must say we have good performance, uh, even if it's risky, because of course, being the, the public investment bank, uh, we have a mandate to take, uh, to take, you know, to go towards uh, more risky situations than, than the average of the market. Uh, for example, we don't do LBO mid cap. Uh, the market doesn't need us. We do, we do small cap. We do venture capitals from seed to growth, and we do mid cap, but but not leveraged. And also, we invest in in French listed multinationals. Overall, uh, we we have um, a performance of uh, average value creation from the creation of the bank to today of seven percent per year. So this equity question is key. We had your countryman, Sir Xavier Rollet, on a little while ago, and he said the Achilles heel of Europe is its over-reliance of debt financing, France being a great example, and an absence or insufficiency of the equity culture. So it seems like that's an enormous task. Now, you're hinting that there's a change, you know, sociologically, uh, you know, in the youth, but we all know that unlike you know, the US where raising large amounts of money for VC and, you know, and PE has been relatively easy. This has been hard work in Europe. How, how have you grasped it? I think we can say it has changed. I can, I can even state that, uh, you know, a good, a good project, uh, be it the technological startups or, um, or a classical SME, I would say, uh, for what the, um, look for equity, finds equity in front. If, if, if it doesn't find equity, it's, it, it is that the project is not good. There is, there is really abundance of equity. Where there is a need today, I would say, uh, is two uh, new verticals. The first one is what we call industrial startups. You know, the, the, the family of Elon Musk. Well, uh, if you're a pure digital company, the family of, uh, of Facebook, you will find money. If you're a classical industry company, you will find money. But if you're a, a, an industrial startup, so you're building your first factory out of um, a deep tech uh, technology uh, with a new team, uh, so it's venture, but it's industrial. This is new. We finance that massively. Uh, and we are starting only now to create an ecosystem of, of um, industrial venture capital funds, which is, which is something new to France. And the certain vertical in which uh, we are not where we would, we would like to be is the cornerstone investors in, in the technological listings. Because uh, remember, we don't have pension funds in France. 
So the pension funds in Northern Europe quite often are the, the cornerstone investors at the moment of IPO of the of the unicorns of those countries. Same same in the US, by the way. Huh? But in France, we don't have uh, pension funds. We have insurance companies uh, who tend not to take uh, shares in listed companies of that kind. And therefore, uh, we, we are currently striving to organize, again, an ecosystem of institutional investors in France that will become with us institution, uh, cornerstone investors at the moment of IPOs of the 25 unicorns of the landscape. Now, you're, presumably these insurance companies are also hindered by Solvency II uh, regulations. Are you frustrated by, you know, the political level, the, uh, the inflexibility of, you know, of opportunity set? Yes, we are. No, no, undoubtedly we are. So one of the things you mentioned, and again, it intrigued me as I read through your papers, is that you are on the one level providing finance and on the other level you're providing guidance, training, consultancy, and you've got this expression, you want to be the one-stop shop for entrepreneurs. Just explain great, great ambition, but practically, uh, how does that get done? Okay. So um, we, we have a toolbox of consulting services, which is composed of uh, classical consulting assignments that, that last between three days and, and 15 days. We don't recruit our own consultants. We have a pool of freelancers. They are 1,500, mostly seniors, uh, which is something essential for the, uh, for the SME uh, leaders and bosses. So the freelancers were youngsters 20 years before in those big, big, big houses, and now they work for themselves and they have a lot of experience. We have 1,500 of them. Yeah. And we push them to the French departmental territories and regions, uh, and it's very, very fruitful. The the entrepreneur pays half uh, half of the price. He pays the Monday, I pay the Tuesday. He pays the Wednesday, I pay the Thursday, and that's the way it goes. Then after, we have created 150 schools for entrepreneurs, which we call the accelerators. The difference is that uh, you, you, you belong to uh, a team of 20 to 30 entrepreneurs who work together during two years. Peer-to-peer -peer pressure is maximum, and uh, you have access to consultants. You go back to uh, HEC, uh, you know, business calls, and uh, it's called Accelerator because, because um, uh, the charter, the sort of ethical charter of, of the school is I want to double the size of my company. How do I do it? That's, so we, we, we welcome to our schools 1,000 SMEs per year. So it's big. Yeah. And within that, of course, is this ambition that you mentioned earlier on is to encourage innovation. We had the head of McKinsey's strategy on talking about how that remains one of the great goals and one of the most difficult to effect. And again, I wonder taking it from the high level to the implementation, how you think you're winning in that in that battle to enhance innovation? That's a very good question, of course. So we have some KPIs. Uh, one of them is that we, we have uh, promised to uh, generate 500 deep tech startups per year in France. To, uh, uh, when we when we played that, it was in January 2019. At that time, we were at 50. And now we are at 350 in 2022. So uh, we have made a lot of progresses, and we will we will achieve the 500 deep tech startups per year. We have another KPI, which is that uh, at least 50 percent of those deep tech startups are green techs, and it's the case. And we have another KPI, which is that uh, those deep tech startups at some point become industrial startups because they have invented complex objects that need to be fabricated, I would say, uh, built, uh, industrialized. And before, obviously, people would immediately go to Shenzhen, China. Today, the question why not in France is, is, is a relevant question, is a legitimate question. So we have also um, 
you know, designed a target, which is that we want to create 100 new factories per year in France out of those de deep tech startups. So as you see, we are very quantitative and we follow that month by month. One of the great French strengths is, of course, that quantitative approach, you know, in so many areas. And we were introduced to you through Paul Desmarais, the chairman and CEO of Cigar Holdings. But he did have a question for you. I think he probably wanted to put you on the spot, which is how have you created an entrepreneurial and innovative approach in a government organization? And he cited your recent retail product as an example. Right. Well, I was lucky enough to have the, the trust of... Um two French presidents, François Hollande and then Emmanuel Macron. I have a governance with a board in which we have a, a lot of independent board members coming from the private sector. Myself, I consider as a sort of, uh, at the same time, serious citizen, but also a, a market guy. I mean, I, I spent, you know, 10 years in telecom, private, and 10 years in IT, private. So um, you, you, you're not going to change me. And it makes a major, major difference with all the civil servants with whom I, I, I interact uh, every week. And they respect that. Though the good news for, for maybe the, the people who are listening to me is that uh, in a country like France, which, which uh, may bear the reputation of being uh, you know, very vertical and uh, influenced by politics and so forth, in the past 10 years, Probably only three times did I get a phone call asking me to invest in this or that company. And I said, no. <laughs> so that answers your question. Very good. That's, it does. But that's just, just, just because it was brought up, what is this example of this retail product? Ah, uh, so I always thought that private equity was probably, uh, you know, the best asset class in all those years of low interest rates. And uh, it, it was something inappropriate democratically uh, to make it impossible for the people to invest in it. So I decided to create a product which was a private equity for the people. And this is what we did. So we, we tranched our portfolio and organized a secondary transaction and allowed the French people to invest in uh, our portfolio of private equity with uh, minimum tickets of... Uh, 3,000 euros, and it was a major success in France. And so now, uh, and this is the good news, a lot of institutional investors has, have replicated the product, and I think France is, is probably, in continental Europe, the country in which really we have opened the avenues of uh, democratization of private equity. Yes, I would think that's right, and we obviously know where the US is with this, but we can see how fractured and how, how much difference there is in the European landscape. Now, we had Philip Fries, who is the head of KKR Europe's private equity business on the show last year, and he was very excited about the European landscape and opportunities, which, of course, some may say doesn't chime with the macro position. Just broadly, as you look at Europe, and we have got this, some would say malaise, we have you know all the challenges. What is exciting you? Well, there are, there are so many uh, investment opportunities in Europe today. It's unbelievable. And you're right to state that the contrast between the reality of opportunities and the, and, and the global colors of malaise is something uh, inexplicable. The, the, the difficulty probably for the non-European people is to understand the complexity of uh, what's happening between the 27 countries today. I mean, when you look at the, at the past five years, the speed at which, uh, you know, the acceleration of federalism has taken us by surprise is, is, is unbelievable. So, of course, it's vociferous and, and it can look like uh, something, you know, uh, not organized uh, uh, and sort of Cambrian, but, but, but at the end of the day, it's a reality. It's a reality. All those countries are massively investing in climate change. So uh, for infrastructure financing business, it's a, it's a cornucopia. Tech in Europe, because of the quality of the universities, is across the board, all over the place, all in all the countries. 
and 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 I would say, of course, in Europe, I I, I, I integrate UK. Huh? UK remains a, an extraordinary place for deep tech. Extraordinary place for deep tech. I mean, uh, we have a, li- a deep respect for what's happening in the UK in that respect. Huh? So um, I would say, too bad for the for for those who don't understand that. <laughs> <laughs> well, what is clear is that you are ahead of the UK with your wealth fund. And Will Campion, my co-founder, met recently with the Lord Mayor of the City of London, Nicholas Lyons. And he said, we in the UK need a private sector UK growth fund of at least 50 billion to invest in long-term asset classes, including infrastructure and private equity, to support the growth economy, green tech and renewables. What advice would you give to somebody who possibly has the disadvantage of not being where France is, but has the advantage of starting at least and learning from others. What are the one or two things you would advise a place like the UK to do in starting a wealth fund? I think the tail of the game, uh, and, 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 and uh, yeah, I mean, this, this is where uh, you know if you have built something reasonable or not, is when you start to uh, take LB money else than the government money. I mean, if, if you start to manage on behalf of, L, of private LPs, uh, as a sovereign fund, it means that you have reached the good point of independence. This is the case of BPI. Where B, BPI, we, out of the 55 billion euros, we have 10 billion euros of, uh, of LP money, and it's going to be more and more uh, from the Gulf sovereign funds, for example, but also from the insurance companies, from the family offices, from the French corporates, and so forth. So I, w- I would say uh, the uh, the idea, what, this is what I wanted to build, and I think we have succeeded. It, it was a sort of French Temasek. You see, so Temasek has a public origin, but it's totally market practice, and it is recruiting capital uh, outside of this Singaporean government. And it's the same for us. Uh, we we are even managing now big funds, which are totally private funds, in which whatsoever the the public governance has no voice. We we have a fund of five point two billion euros, which is managed by uh, BPI France uh, Equity Branch, and it's a private fund. It's a pure private fund. And do you find that you, as one of these number of sovereign wealth funds, talk to each other quite a lot and compare best practice, or do, 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 do these sovereign wealth funds tend to exist in isolation? No, no, no. They talk. They talk a lot in different instances, but they have different origins. The miracle, I would call it a miracle, of of uh, the the creation of BPI ten years ago was that uh, there was a, a broad based political consensus to merge. A bank, an equity branch, um, a funds of funds, uh, in a single entity, and this you have, uh, you know, th- 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 those elements you you find them in all the European countries, but they have not merged. You have an agency for innovation, you have a small bank for SME, you have another funds of funds with different governances, and for the entrepreneur, you need you need to know four to five uh, phone numbers. And why hasn't it not merged in the other countries? Because it's true that when you merge it all, it creates a powerhouse, and and a lot of a lot of countries are you know cautious before uh, this idea to create such a powerhouse at, in in the middle of the political ecosystem, <laughs> and not to not to be in the parliamentary countries of Northern Europe, uh, which which I think is a pity because uh, for the entrepreneurs. A completely changes, completely changes the landscape. Uh, so uh, my dream is that in all the European countries we have a, a BBI, which would be a sort of uh, partner and colleague with whom we could build uh, many, many uh, cross-border partnerships. So I think there are going to be many people listening to this episode who will be, quite frankly, very surprised and intrigued um, and um, will applaud what has been going on because many would not, like myself, have known this. But France is in the grip of protests against pension reforms. It's not unique. Strikes are happening across the world. We've got a demographic issue, you know, in Europe. 
where does the solution lie in recognizing that innovation, stimulus, job creation, entrepreneurship is absolutely central to the escape route, and yet these vested interests are proving immovable? You're right. The paradox is that the unemployment has never been so low. I mean, you would not find a single French entrepreneur who's not complaining against the impossibility to recruit today. There is no credit crunch at all. There is no equity crunch at all. Innovation is pervasive. The schools are working like mad, delivering good engineers and so forth. And um, and the French people still are, you know, uh, a lot of them, not all of them, but a lot of them very much afraid about the future. So that's that's the paradox of a country which in which the economy is good. The, the, the welfare state has never been as generous as it is today, but people are afraid. So uh, the role of BPI, what is it in that in the, in that dimension? It is to say to these to to everybody, and this is what we say every day, precisely because we have the most generous welfare state of the continent, you are free to become entrepreneurs. I mean, the risk is low. You are covered. You will have a, a retirement. You you have you you don't pay a single euro for your health. You don't pay a single euro for your education. The, the public transportation is subsidized and so forth. Much much more in other countries, and um, for everything. So precisely for that reason, you can become what you wanted to be, a free person, an entrepreneur. That's that's the spirit of BPI fault. Right. Well, that reminds me of Thomas Jefferson's quotation, which is, a walk around Paris will provide lessons in history, beauty, and in the point of life. So there we go. And an entrepreneurial culture. I have a few closing questions for you, which are very general. You live in one of the great countries for food and wine. I, we did have uh, Etienne Bizeau, the CEO of Bollinger, on an episode recently, which was fascinating. If you are going to pick a bottle of wine, Burgundy, Bordeaux, or Alsace? Ah, Moselle. Moselle, okay. Yeah, Alsace, Alsace Moselle, exactly. Un unknown wines, extraordinary wines. Fantastic. Um, now, I've read that you're an ardent mountain climber, and in fact, did a month-long excursion in the Himalayas. And what does that give you? You know, uh, mountain climbing... Uh, re rejuvenates your uh, appetite for life like uh, no other sports <laughs> because of the of the pulsation of the body that is necessary to reach the summits and uh, and then when it's a when it's a one month complete isolation expedition in Himalaya um, I mean you are recentered I can tell you. Well, on that subject, you may be familiar with the great French painter, Gabriel Lopé, who comes out of Chamonix, and uh, I'm in the Alps at the moment, but I, there is a magnificent Gabriel Lopé exhibition at the Forte di Bard, which is just below Aosta. As you drive through the Grand Sabinard, you keep going. This is a magnificent fort that Napoleon held Napoleon up for 40 days on his march on Turin, and so angry was he that he destroyed it. It was rebuilt, I think, 200 years ago a magnificent alpine exhibition and a good friend of the show, William Mitchell, who has actually curated, I think there are 60 Lope paintings and find yourself there at the Forte di Bar because it's absolutely beautiful. Yeah. Um, three Thank closing you, questions. You know, uh, I have a house in Chamonix. Oh, you do? Well, they're, voila, that's, it's going to be through the tunnel. Forte di, I'll send you the link to it anyway. Um, really very, very special. And I just, uh, as you find in Italy, magnificent food, great stylish uh, sort of, you know, um, accommodation and sensible prices. Um, so, uh, so, so, so now also coming from a, this country of great culture and so much, I would like you just to share with the listeners your famous, your, 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 I'll start again, your favorite French film, French book, and French restaurant. Uh, you know what? Currently, I'm, I'm reading a lot of English books in English. Okay. We'll allow you to answer an English book then. <laughs> so I've, I've, this summer, I read, I read an extraordinary book, uh, which is from Simon Chama, 
It's the history of uh, the British Wars. Extraordinary book. Simon Shama is one of your great, great historians. I read a lot of history, actually. Uh, a good restaurant? You know, I'm not a great favorite of uh, a big brands of uh, restaurants in which you have a, a zillions of uh, very, very small... <laughs> I'm not a favorite of that. What I, what I mostly prefer is a small restaurant which is just here on the boulevards, close to BPI, with uh, we call that minute cooking, exceptional, fresh, and good. And uh, you, uh, the, the movie? The movie. So many, many, many movies. Difficult to say. Honestly, difficult to say. <laughs> but you haven't given us the name of that restaurant, that maybe because you're going to find it's booked out. And then you can't get into your favorite restaurant, but you need to give us the name. In the new, it is Passage des Panoramas. Passage de Panorama. Okay, well, that's that's well. I'm definitely going to go and try it on my next visit to. I don't need to know Passage de Panorama. It's 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 brilliant. Okay, um, and of course, the question that anybody listening to you and your very articulate and sensible and successful approach is going to ask: Why not run for president? <laughs> I, I, you know, I'm, I'm, you, you see what what is the real life of a president today. Have you seen? Do, do I need to comment? Yes, no, no you are. You uh, are. You are the, quite right. We we might say no more. <laughs> I mean, you you need to have a resistance to aggression, which which is equal to honor. Well, look, Nicholas, you have been very generous with your time, and I think that, as I mentioned, people will be very surprised. You encapsulated by saying your ambition is almost to become a French Temasek. And I think that that uh, and what you've been doing is is represents a proper entrepreneurial push that Europe needs. So I think people will be amazed that 50% of youngsters want to be entrepreneurs in France as opposed to working in you know the uh, civil service or, or, or other disciplines. And yet Europe, for all of the macro headwinds and contradictions and political intrigue, to use a euphemism, um, there are lots of opportunities, which is keeping you motivated and excited and others. And, um, you know, maybe m m maybe the negativity is overdone. So, Nicholas, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you for that. It was a great pleasure.